We are back, and we are joined now by Vincent Bevins, a longtime journalist, author of If We Burn, The Mass Protest Decade and The Missing Revolution. Uh, Vincent, thank you so much for coming on today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me. So your book really looks at this central question, um, and it's, it's expansive <laughs> and ambitious in, in a way that I really appreciate. The, the, and it's an analysis of a decade of mass protest, right? Starting right. really with the Arab Spring and, and ending with COVID. Um, before we get into more of the specifics here, yeah. I'm just wondering if you could give people a sense of the time frame of that you that you wanted to analyze um right. and really that that central question as i say of with all these protests why has there been such little structural change and or revolution or indeed the change we saw was often the the wrong kind or right certainly not what was asked for by the streets as, as much as we could understand what the streets were asking for so yeah absolutely thank you so much um it is indeed ambitious it seeks to be a, a history it seeks really to try to tell the story of the last decade 2010 to 2020 so i go from january 1st 2010 to january 1st 2020 and it is global in scope um so that is not perhaps at first uh, at first glance like wildly ambitious far too ambitious but it is delimited by a central concern right like any work of history um it chooses to build the the, the story around a, a a set of things that are considered important for for the reader now and, and that main question is, how is it possible that so many mass protests led to the opposite of what they asked for? Now, not every episode that I analyze in the book ends this way, but far more in this way than anybody would have expected back in 2010. Um, and it is really kind of a conundrum that overturns a lot of the assumptions that we had about uh, um, revolution and indeed political resistance of any kind um, 10, 15 years ago. And so, I think that it is possible, I hope that it is possible to do so, to tell the story of that decade as if the thing that really powered history in that in those 10 years is mass protests of a certain type that got far larger than they were expected to, to, to by the original organizers or participants, and that really changed the course of um, history in many countries, and I think indeed the global system. So it, 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 it attempts to put all of that at the center of a history of the last decade um, that hopefully readers can come to, um, not only to understand what happened, like what happened in you know, the so-called Arab Spring, what happened between you know, Brazil in uh, 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 Hong Kong and Ukraine from 2013 to 2014, but to speak to concerns um, that really matter to people that will be trying to change the world in the future. Well, Let's start with Brazil, because that's how you start your book, right? I mean, and and, and talking about your experiences there um, in 2013, how you were both attacked by military police, and then, you know, how that protest movement on the ground just began to morph into something that wasn't really representative of the, sh of the, the goals that um, were delineated in the outset. Um, Talk a bit about your experience and 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 how uh, you know how the, how everything began to shift. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Brazil is kind of the central narrative of this book, um, even though it's just one of many episodes analyzed because I lived through it. So I put myself in that story to the extent that I am in it, just um, because I was so close to what happened, as you as you as you mentioned at the beginning of a particular set of protests in June 2013, <clears throat> a small set of leftists and anarchists were agitating for a reduction in the price of the bus fare. Now, the first set of protests succeeded in making noise, succeeding in shutting down parts of the city, but like the dominant forces in Brazilian society, the media eventually came to the conclusion that we need to crack down on these kids. This needs to be, uh, this needs to be taken care of basically asking for the military police. Now, the, the police in Brazil are military police as a legacy of the US-backed dictatorship, basically asking for the military police to crack down. Now on June 13th, and this is the, the moment that I'm hit, though the fact that other journalists are hit even more severely really changes the, the story moving forwards. Uh, the military police do crack down. They crack down so forcefully that it shocks mainstream media, the major voices in the country into entirely changing the way that they view the protest, they go from saying, these are punks and anarchists that we need to sweep off the streets immediately to, no, indeed, this is a uprising, a patriotic demonstration of the right 
uh, of, of Brazilians to express themselves in the streets. And as millions of people pour into the streets, this new interpretation delivered by the Brazilian media leads people to believe that the protests are about something other than what the original protesters would have thought it was about. Um, these two groups, you know, very broadly speaking, the original leftist uh, punks and anarchists come often into like violent conflict with the new arrivals. And then a week later, after this initial crackdown that I outlined on June 13th, I witness what we would now consider the beginning of the far right movement in Brazil, but it didn't exist. No one even imagined that could have ever happened in 2013. People like that, uh, people acting in the ways that we would now recognize that Bolsonaristas act in dress. No supporters of far-right President Jair Bolsonaro, actually expelling the original leftists uh, and punks from the streets, actually getting, throwing them out and saying, no, that's not, it's not about your little left-wing parties and your cute little social democratic or, or anarchist dreams. It's about what we say it's about. Um, and the original organizers had planned on this getting much, they, they hoped for it to explode but it exploded in a way that they had never expected and the explosion did not work out well for them. It was, this was, they were horrified often by the direction that it took. And long story short, a lot of elements are born in this sort of pressure cooker of June, 2013, that find ways to take advantage of political opportunities in that moment and later uh, in, the, in the next years in Brazil. Um, ultimately removing a democratically elected president, ultimately supporting a corrupt anti-corruption a uh, campaign that places Lula in jail. Uh, and ultimately, all of these elements come together to lead to probably the most extreme right-wing elected president on planet Earth uh, taking office in 2019, or indeed the exact opposite of what it appeared that the streets were asking for back in, in, the, in the days of June 13 when I went out uh, before getting tear gassed by, by the military police. Is that a failure of militancy on a part on the part of um, protesters? Uh, is that a uh, lack of political education on the differences between um, like anti-government uh, sentiment and uh, and, and uh, populism and breaking things versus uh, that like breaking things, but with the uh, understanding that it's to, to build up some sort of leftist um, government in, in its wake. Is that, you know, part of the central issue that we often see, which is um, the, the, the splintering of certain kind of uh, organized efforts to upend the system um, in ways that are a bit, a bit chaotic because it's not centered around traditional leftist or as you talk you talk a bit in the book about the old left right i mean like what what uh principles as opposed to um just a general kind of animus mm -hmm. yeah intentional organizational forms with long-term strategy and, and real structure was something that would have been entirely natural um to people that were trying to change the world in the first half of the 20th century the uh black civil rights organizations that were so heroic in the 50s and 60s and who indeed inspired um, so much of the new left would have taken for granted that you needed structure, organization, discipline, um, and long-term strategy. Now that sort of falls away, I think, for ideological and material reasons in the second half of the 20th century. Not only do people believe by the end of the 20th century that there's something sort of inherently problematic about that. Not everybody believes that, but these assumptions uh, exist in wide enough um, spheres that, that this sort of ideological uh, 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 precondition exists for really the way that I think a lot of these mass process explosions are covered by people like me uh, in the English speaking media. And then also you sort of get the, the, the actual concrete material decimation of a lot of the organizations that were put together, you know, a lot, you know, by the end of the 20th century, the end of the 21st century, people are atomized, they're individualized, people are sort of to the extent that they have a connection to the, th the, the movement that they en end up joining on the streets, it's that they all saw the same thing on the internet and then they sort of find out on the streets who the other people are um, that are part of this movement. It comes together um, in a very, uh, in a way which is not really built by or conducive to proper collective action. And I think that a, an assumption was shared um, again, especially in the English speaking media, but across a lot of, a lot of, um, the world in, especially the liberal North Atlantic world in the nineties and the two thousands, 
that if, you know, you sort of overthrew a bad thing that something better was going to come mm. along. Sort of deep, wow. deep, this deep, deep belief in sort of the ideology of progress, this deep, deep belief that the world was going towards something. You know, this was the explicit thesis kind of of Fukuyama's end of history book. Certainly a lot of um, people in the U.S. government believed that the internet and internet led um, uh, internet led uprisings would lead to things that were good for them. So, like this was a major uh, tenet of thinking about the Democratic uh, and Republican parties. Now, especially liberals, they tend to think the exact opposite. That like if the internet caused people to run into the streets, that's maybe right. something really problematic. That's actually maybe some foreign power that's ruining America rather than the the universalization of the American dream. Um, and I think that this tendency to view the explosion. Um, as something that was necessarily going to lead to something better taking its place was understandable in some, to some extent. I mean, the particular ideological and organizational form of this one, um, this one group in Brazil, they were uh, explicitly horizontalists. So that meant that they had they didn't believe in leadership. They had no leaders. They they rotated their members um, uh, constantly. Uh, they they rotated tasks. Um, everything should be decided by consensus. Um, all of you understand. It's very understandable where all that comes from. It's very understandable why they believed that this would lead to the type of explosion that would be good for them. It just turned out not to be true, quite tragically. And this particular organizational form that works quite well for them for eight years in as a tight knit group planning for their protests um, left them both sort of ideologically and organizationally incapable of rising to the opportunity that was perhaps presented to them when the people rushed into the streets in June 2013. And this is kind of something we see across the decade, even though the cases are very, very different. This is another problem is you see the sort of copying and pasting of tactics from one country to a very different country um, where conditions are very different or indeed after it's become clear that in the original country that the tactic didn't even work out that well. Um, but what often, what happened in Brazil, what happens uh, in many places is that when this explosion happens, this opportunity is because the protest itself, especially the uh, protest of this particular form uh, an apparently spontaneous, leaderless, horizontally organized, digitally coordinated format uh, for a uh, protest. Because this particular type of protest cannot take advantage of the opportunity, someone else does. And that and that's often a very cynical or powerful actor, existing elites, um, uh, powerful economic forces in society, a foreign power that may use this as an excuse to launch the intervention that they've always been wanting to launch in this part of the world, but now there's a power vacuum, so they do it. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think you're right to point to both sort of some ideological assumptions, but also like the particular type of society that ended up discovering a clear desire to change the, the global system, but without the the organizational structures required to take advantage of what comes from this, these explosions. I, I'm struck by a lot of things that you say here. One is like, you know, the the, the fact that we'll, we'll talk obviously about the, the neoliberal word in, in a second and, and, and what that means for for these kinds of protests. But it's also the the exportation from the United States and then importation of general um I would say attitudes towards that kind of regime change, which we have engaged in um, over the past century and seeing how those kinds of um, uh, th that kind of thinking can uh, be be embedded in certain movements without necessarily there being the 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 larger structural change uh, element that's that's uh, the ballast for for these movements, but also you know, how the, the limitations as well of anti-corruption politics, I guess, as it relates to Brazil uh, mm -hmm. and other countries is fascinating to me where it's more when, when you talk about how some of these movements were just about getting the bad guy out and and not really necessarily having something in its place to, to build it back up, um, you know, when you're dealing in anti-corruption politics inherent in in that uh, that thesis is that it's really just this uh, cabinet, this leader that is uh, it corrupting the system. Uh, and we just got to get that guy out and put our guy in. Mm -hmm. And that is a very ideologically flimsy um, kind of way to go about revolution because there is not the i guess necessary um 
uh, ideological underpinnings to make it more robust. Um, mm -hmm. I said a, a good amount there, but I'm curious what you think. No, I think there's two really interesting points that you raised, especially in the Brazilian context. One, the guys that ended up running the anti-corruption campaign in Brazil did have an ideological project. It was not clear uh, to everyone at first, but eventually it turns out these are far-right guys. These guys end up joining the Bolsonaro administration. So uh, that's related to the other point that, that you bring up. That So when, as happens very unexpectedly in June 2013, everybody, literally everybody is invited to the streets for whatever whatever reason any individual wants to come to the streets for, whatever, and like literally everyone is offered a, an invitation to come to the streets and protest whatever it is that you want to protest. You end up sort of reproducing just the common sense that already exists in a given society. Um, and often, you know, I forget who says this sort of some, somewhat dismissively might be a bad guy, but don't don't get mad at me. The, 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 the quote is still interesting that the, the protests become uh, against everything that's bad and for everything that's good. So anti-corruption is something that is like, so uh, being against corruption is so obvious as to be meaningless, right? Because you have to you have to start answering the questions that you started outlining, like, well, how, what particular type of anti-corruption practices are you going to employ? Because everyone's against corruption. By definition, it's like being anti-crime. And like, ironically, <laughs> ironically, Sergio Moro, the, one of the main judges, the main judge in the the now discredited um, Lava Jato uh, campaign, he ended up trying to pat, pat like he ended up uh, penning a anti crime law when he came up uh, in in like the Bolsonaro government. Like like all cr all laws are anti crime. Everyone's anti corruption. <laughs> right. So when you when you make a movement about anti corruption, that's something that everyone can kind of get behind, but that it does it, it does not answer the question of how this. Uh, problem is going to be attacked in practice, and the Lava Jato task, for, task Force, we now know, um, learning a lot from the United States before they started operating, in contact with the United States the entire time that they are um, on this on this crusade to ultimately put Lula in jail. What they're doing is they're breaking the law, and they're looking at one particular party more closely than they're looking at everybody else. And this becomes clear later, but at the moment, this is one of the various ideological strands that becomes quite powerful out of this sort of invitation to invite everybody onto the streets for whatever reason, because everyone's anti-corruption. But what's, what specifically that, what does that mean? Right, right, exactly. Um, I mean, and, and I also, uh, quick, quick pivot here, but uh, you mentioned uh, some of the technological elements earlier that influence, obviously, um, the, the these protests. It's been, I think, a... a a general thesis about say the arab spring that the rise of social media and technology was a big part of that um but what how do you from your vantage point assess uh the role of the united states as technology um mm -hmm. and technology in general but with u.s influence on some of yeah. these protest movements yeah i think it is right to point out that the like we didn't get the internet in the abstract what we got shaping the built environment of social media, the experience of being online for the vast majority of the world's people is US based capitalist firms operating for profit. And that, I think that was not the only way that the internet could have taken shape. Uh, the fact that it took shape in that way, rather than all of the ways that it could have taken shape um, has a lot to do with the disappointment and the indeed like the ways that we all have lost our minds, I think to some extent um, from being being on the internet all day long. Um, when it comes to the beginning of this, this what I call the mass protest decade, starting in Tunisia in 2010 and then going to Egypt uh, in the beginning of 2011 and, and the creation of the so-called Arab Spring, there was a lot of debate back then as to the role, well, especially U.S. English-speaking media um, were quite excited about the idea that social media had been a part of it, and that was seen as a necessarily good thing. Um, now, where I come down 10 years later is that for the type of particular mass protest explosion that I analyze, which is one that becomes so big that it either dislodges or fundamentally destabilizes a, a government, you can never have that particular kind of explosion without multiple causes. You need to have many, many things coming together. You need to have material conditions for the people. You need to have the right combination of, of different elements of society coming together. You need many, many things. Uh, but I think one of the things that gets you over the line one of the things that makes them larger than expected in a way that ends up mattering is social media. Now, that doesn't mean that it's about social media. And that right. also doesn't mean that, that the influence of social media is a good thing. 
because uh, the the like while it allows for the instantaneous transfer of sort of solidarity across borders and while it allows for everybody um, to learn things immediately, uh, social media ultimately, especially as the decade goes on, is used in ways that were, were not imagined and like powerful forces can influence social media, which was sort of forgotten or, or not understood uh, at the beginning of the decade. These for-profit capitalist firms driven by advertising revenue decide what we see based on what will be more likely to allow them to sell products to us, right? Like they choose to show us what will keep us glued to our phones so that other co companies can advertise to us. Um, and so, yes, I think that social media is one of the things that gets the initial so-called Arab Spring over the line, but that doesn't mean that it's about social media. Uh, if you asked people, I mean, most people were not online. Most people were more likely to be looking at television. Um, than Facebook and in places like Tunisia and Egypt, most more people were likely to be talking about economic justice than the things that often the global media imposed, like the, the, the things that the international media saw in the squares because that's what they wanted to see in the squares. Um, so yeah, I think social media is a part, not the primary mover, and, and to the extent that it's a part, uh, not necessarily a good for in, in, in ways that have positive consequences. Well, and so how can you ensure then, as maybe a lesson going forward, uh, that your protest movement isn't a, a a replication of, like, say, capitalist interests from the perspective of the of the mediator uh, or or the me uh, not the mediator, the medium, right, on social media mm -hmm. um, versus uh, something organic because it the, it leaves a lot of vulnerabilities, I would imagine, when methods of communication are um, so heavily influenced in the way that you accurately describe. Yeah, and I think so. I This book is primarily a work of history, and the work of history is built on 200, 250 interviews that I did in 12 countries over four years. And these people you know, agreed to tell me their stories, often very difficult stories, so I could build this history. But the reason they did so, the reason they were willing to spend their time with me, the reason they were willing to go through often traumatic moments is because they believed that there was something to be learned from this, that the idea was to look forward and to take this very obvious desire to improve the global system um, and sort of match it with better tactics so that the next generation could learn from, some, from things that did work, because again, some things did work, um, and the things that did not work in the 2010s. And some of the things that come become common across different national and political environments, apart from the very, very obvious lesson, you need to pay, pay attention first and foremost to the ways that your condition is different than the other thing that you've seen. Uh, pay very, very close attention to the ways that your system is constituted and act upon it in ways that will improve it without necessarily, you know, you. It's amazing to be inspired by something that happens elsewhere. But as, we, as I said, there was a sort of copying and pasting of tactics that might have worked better there or may, maybe would work here, but not exactly right now. Um, so apart from the lesson to pay very, the obvious lesson to pay very, very, very close uh, attention to your particular uh, configurations of power. Um, another uh, Something that came up across many, many countries, well, there's a lot of things, but probably the easiest one to summarize is that People came to me and said, we wish we were more organized before the explosion. Um, as a general rule for seeing who does the best in the wake of these unexpected mass protest events, it is the groups that are most organized before history comes knocking, that are most organized before the, 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 the revolutionary moment in the streets. Uh, because trying to throw together an organization or a coherent, coherent movement or, you know, as organizers, no organizers is very, is, is very hard. It takes, you know, a lot of hard work. Um, and the people that did that hard work sort of in the off season, uh, so to speak, uh, beforehand tended to do the best. And the types of organizations that people found to really work are the ones that allow for real collective action. Uh, so a democratic, a truly a democratic organization, but they can also act collectively um, and respond quickly to changing conditions with changing tactics and indeed stay solid in the long term. And so this is something that is very common across movements that come together very quickly because of sort of a viral post or, or, or an inspiring thing uh, on the internet. Often the structure does not remain after the initial animus dissipates. That makes total sense. Um, so based on your analysis, 
I think there was only one, my recollection, that you would say was successful, um, or we, the, you would define as having some success. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but if, that, if you don't mind telling a bit about that example um, mm -hmm. and what others can learn from it. Yeah, so there's two. So the 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 the, the book ends with both Chile and Hong Kong, and Chile is 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 a successful Hong Kong, of course, uh, and uh, uh, in disaster for a lot of the original organizers. Uh, but also South Korea earlier in the decade is a success. The the candlelight revolution does succeed in um, in removing a, a president um, you know, very very credibly accused of corruption. Um, so in these two cases. Uh, some commonalities are that in both South Korea and Chile, you have you have labor action, you have union power that is able to put a put real pressure on elites in a given society at moments in which they can't really ignore. Because depending on where you are and what you're doing, often elites can ignore people on the street. I mean, if they don't like the people, you know, if they if they are not inclined to to sympathize with the people on the streets. They can wait it out often, but usually elites in a capitalist society do not put up with the reduction of profits the, with, a, with a real hit to the economy. So both in both South Korea and Chile, the importance of unions matter. And as I kind of tried to sketch out earlier, when these explosions occur unexpectedly, if they're on, if they are incapable of speaking for themselves with one voice, if they're incapable of presenting um, uh, a set of demands or a revolutionary project or indeed taking power and forming a new state uh, because of the particular nature of like an individualized protest, usually someone ends up speaking for them. So, you know, there's the famous quote from the 18th Brumaire, like those who cannot represent themselves will be represented. Um, I kind of reformulated uh, again here in this book to say those that cannot speak for themselves will be spoken for. So luckily in the case of Chile in 2019, for example, Gabriel Boric and other uh, people in the political establishment understand well enough what's going on in the streets to impose a solution upon this this um, quite complex and and cacophonous explosion, which is close enough to what a lot of people are out there for that it ends up uh, 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 dissipating the crowds, and then you get the long term project to 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 replace the Pinochet constitution with a new one. Now, that hasn't been uh, successful yet. That's another right. history of the book. It takes a long time to build uh, a better future. Uh, uh, you know, it's okay if the the if everything is not resolved in the short term. But this generation that really came out of the 2011 protests in Chile now became the government. So Boric became the president of Chile. Camila Vallejo, one of the more uh, recognizable figures from the 2011 protests, um, is a major figure in the government. And it was because the representation that the this social explosion in Chile ended up getting from the people that were already in the establishment was close enough uh, to what, even though a lot of people rejected this 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 solution at the time, a lot of the people that were in the streets rejected the solution at the time. But in the long term, many of them came to the conclusion that this was close enough to what was being asked for that it did set us on some kind of a long term path for transformation of, of Chilean society, even if. Borch, you know, the Borch government stumbles, even if the constitution is not replaced in the first or second or third try, at least that generation took power, yeah. um, which is very different what happened than what happened in places like Egypt, where you have a worse dictatorship than before, Brazil, the decimation uh, uh, of progressive forces until finally the PT puts things back together and um, is able to, to, to win power democratically uh, last year. So yeah, that's, I think that's the, 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 the some of the elements that the, the that, that emerge when looking at the victories. Some real, like, some real elements of working class power that force elites to really pay attention. And then the representation that is ultimately provided is legitimate, as close to legitimate as possible, given the very strange and sort of illegible, very difficult to understand nature of these um, uh, apparently spontaneous mass explosions. Well, um, your book is very detailed, and for some of the other stories, I would really encourage people to check it out. Uh, Vincent Bevins, uh, journalist, author of, you know, you're also the author of The Jakarta Method, which I would recommend to anybody. Um, and this book is called If We Burn, The Mass Protest Decade and the Missing Revolution. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much.
Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate anyone that, that, that takes the time to read it. I hopefully, as you say, there's a lot in there, and hopefully, uh, if people come to it with their own experiences, hopefully that different people will find different things. I think there is a lot in this history, and we're just starting to understand what we can learn from it. So yeah, I thank you for 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 your attention. Yeah, we'll, we'll be uh, we'll put a link to it in the description of wherever you're listening to or watching this, and at majority.fm. Thanks so much, Vincent.